Good afternoon, um, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the final panel session. Uh, as Karen just said, this is a session about mobilizing capital. So all the other sessions that you've listened to this afternoon couldn't be done without mobilizing the capital. So well done for, for hanging in there for the, the most important session. Um, my name is Chris Baird. I am a partner with the global firm DLA Piper, based here in London. Um, on our panel today, and I'll introduce the panelists and then we'll get straight into the question, but starting immediately on my right, we have Babatunde Soyoye. Babatunde is a co-founder and managing partner of one of the, if not the biggest and most active private equity firms in Africa, Helios Investment Partners. So welcome, Babatunde. Thank you. Next to Babatunde, we have Mohan Vivekananda. Mohan is a group executive in origination and coverage with the uh, Development Bank of Southern Africa. So welcome, Mohan. Next to Mohan, we have Nick Adonhu. Nick is the CEO of British International Investment, who many of you will know as CDC. Um, prior to becoming CEO, you were also senior advisor to the Bill and Melinda uh, Gates Foundation. So welcome to the panel, Nick. Um, and last, but definitely not least, uh, Nisrin Abulez. Nisrin is Managing Director and Head of the Africa Group for Sumito Mitsui Banking Corporation here in London. So I think, having done the introductions, um, in terms of just setting the scene, the pandemic has definitely, if we ever needed reminding, uh, told us that Africa needs more private capital. Um, I think it's reinforced that particular point. Well, as we sit here today, the global economy is also facing some deep uncertainties. So I, I guess where I'd really like to start at the moment, and maybe Nick and Babatunde can start with you, is what challenges are African countries facing currently in order to attract foreign investment? And what are the factors if any, which are prohibiting that foreign investment at the moment. Nick, maybe we can start with you and Bobby Tunde will bring you in. Yes, thank you. So, no, I think you're absolutely right that what's happening in the world today um, creates the perception of risk everywhere. And when investors see risk, they're likely to, to try to take risk off and the way they take risk off is getting closer to home. And Africa suffers from, and I'm sure we'll talk about it later in the panel, suffers from not having really robust and developed local, develop, uh, local capital markets. So you get this, and we saw this particularly when COVID a year or so two ago is sucking out of capital. At the same time, a lot of the international banks that used to bank Africa effectively for various reasons connected with capital ratios and uh, compliance requirements have also largely pulled back uh, from Africa. So it is a very difficult, a difficult time. And you're right that, you know, uh, Africa, when we look at the SDGs, we have, in terms of development in Africa, we have, the, it is the continent with the furthest distance to travel in terms of achieving these SDGs. And we're only going to do that if we can attract commercial capital. And I think, um, I mean, the reasons why we don't attract, why Africa doesn't attract commercial capital, I think are well known and Baba can certainly talk to, but I, they start with sort of small market sizes, local current, local currency, uh, challenges and risks. Um, I think a significant macro challenge too, in the sense that um, too many of the countries in Africa run large deficits, leading to high inflation, leading to high interest rates, uh, leading to weak currencies. Um, so all of those reasons, I think, make 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 Africa um, uh, both today, but also from a sort of a secular basis, a difficult place uh, to invest in or I'm commercial gonna, capital. I'll bring you in in terms of. Um you know, one, your, your comments on that, you know, you're in the business of, of attracting capital to the continent. What would you say are your current worries, challenges? Oof. Where do I start? <laughs> um, <laughs> um, I, mean, I think at the end of the day, sort of one starts from a sort of macro basis. I think we sort of touched on it earlier. There's some, actually some shining stars in Africa. Look at a country like small, like Rwanda, yes? Um, Rwanda has been a country that um, it's shown rule of law holds. Yep. Um, infrastructure is developed. Um, capital markets people take money in and out. Um, they've just, the country has got excellent leadership. Mm -hmm. That's taken it to a place that actually, I mean, I think 
many of us are in awe of actually how that is actually possible within Africa. So what it shows, I think, first and foremost, I think, well, it's a small country, one could argue it's a small country, it's that a small country, that leadership does matter, yep? Um, leadership with purpose, with a strategy, with a clear objective, and there's lots of it. Just look, the Rwanda story is just, everyone wants to put money in Rwanda, but there's not to put money in Rwanda. A couple that with a country like Nigeria that's full of huge opportunity, 200 million people, nothing. And Nick, would you put money in Nigeria? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. So I think the point I think is this, I think is that leadership, it all starts with leadership, good government, good policy, and it can be done in a short time. Rwanda is, came out of um, the civil war, how long ago? So I just think leadership, leadership, leadership. Um, but of course, it comes with questions like you've got a leader has been there, democracy is not working, it stayed on longer than it should have stayed. But it leads to, I'm diverging a little bit, but I just think leadership is, is important and consistency of policy mm -hmm. that people can understand what the policy is, doesn't dilly-dally, change every two, three years, and it's consistent and it's straightforward. Mm -hmm. I think it's a, it's a big part of it. Okay. And Nishri Mohan, I'd, I'd like to bring you in and, and please do um, feel free to comment on what other people have said. But touching on that point, and Nishri, maybe we'll start with you. What is it that African countries can do to put their best foot forward, to yeah. put them in the best possible position mm. to be able to attract investment, which I think we all understand is, is difficult. But what are, the good, what are the types of things that you think, Bobby Tunde has spoken about Rwanda and, and I agree, but maybe at a um, thematic level, what are the types of things mm. from your experience that you think would be helpful? Thank you for the question. But also, just before I say anything, um, it's very easy to sound pessimistic, right, if we're highlighting the challenges. Mm. It's undeniable that there are plenty of opportunities in, in the continent in these volatile market conditions and even in good market conditions, right? There are opportunities across, across the continent. But, and we were, we were talking about that a little earlier in terms of the investors and whether they understand the continent or not. Mm -hmm. Today, there, you have two, at least in my mind, you have two sets of investors. You have those who have the mandate, and I think most of us, if not all of us in this room, we all have the mandate to do more in, in the continent. Uh, so we don't deal necessarily with the perception of risk. We deal with the real risks that we face, including, um, you have, uh, Tondi mentioned this, the, the leadership, the currency controls, and, and a few others as well. And in the other, on the other hand, you have those who are quite opportunistic, and deal with the perception of risk more than itself. And I think we have had evidence of that more recently. When the markets became volatile, they immediately went out of the continent and they started investing closer to home. But what can be done to try and deal with this? I think there are so many challenges, so these have to be dealt with. But in my mind, there are a couple of things that um, could contribute to making the environment more conducive to investors to come in. One of them is the policies around, or the governance, because governance is linked to every single challenge that we see. For instance, what good does it um, do an investor if capital controls are in place, but then you cannot really make use of it, or if there is a legal framework, but in theory it works, but in practice it doesn't. Uh, so governance is one issue that, that can be done. Um, and another area that um, I wanted to focus on perhaps is the, is the tax the tax system, which is not really prevalent in all of the all of the countries in Africa, I think South Africa is a good example where people pay tax. Um, uh, and the reason why I mention this is because when you have an efficient tax system, which is also linked to the formal and informal sectors and so on and so forth, it's a very deep subject. But today, if you have an efficient tax system, the local governments will stop being heavily reliant on foreign investors to come in. They can have their own revenues. They generate their own revenues. They um, uh, invest these revenues in, in either local projects or in building the right infrastructure or to make the environment more conducive for investors to come in. So this also creates some sort of stability. But this is just, these are the two points that I wanted to, to, to focus on amongst um, many others. Okay, and, and two, two great points, governance <coughs> and taxation. Themes focusing on getting your own house in order uh, as a way of, of attracting in in other investment. Mohan, in terms of what you've seen, obviously a little bit more focus on, on Southern African, but similar types of things where you think governments can be good friends to themselves by taking sensible decisions? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for us, um, we do operate throughout Sub-Saharan Africa, but obviously being based in Johannesburg and as a South African government-owned entity, 
our focus is a bit more in Southern Africa. Um, and you know, if you just take the examples of, of some of the successes that we've seen in South Africa that's making us hopeful, you know, the, the energy sector is one where, on the one hand, even as we speak now, you know, there are very significant problems with what we euphemistically call load shedding, you know, in South Africa. But on the other hand, it's creating massive investment opportunities, and especially for the private sector, because the government has actually opened up finally, you know, investment in generation where you can have private to private transactions taking place. We are literally seeing tens of transactions coming through to us, you know, every month in that, in that sector, along with, you know, selling into the national grid as well. And, and you're seeing, you know, the capital is speaking because the equity IRRs in the last round of energy generation for renewables in South Africa were below 12% in ZAR, right? So dollar terms, you know, that's below 10% equity IRRs for South Africa. So uh, clearly capital is flooding in where they see the opportunity to do it and where there is a level of U.S. macroeconomic stability, but also, you know, um, the opportunities. And, you know, South Africa, macro, you know, our debt to GDP is still quite challenging compared to a lot of, a lot of other countries. We, um, you know, we're quite optimistic about a number of other countries, you know, we're doing a lot in Senegal, in Cote d'Ivoire, in Benin, in Gabon, um, in Tanzania as well. So even outside of Southern Africa, we're seeing a lot of these opportunities, specifically in infrastructure. Also, traditionally, infrastructure had been driven by the governments, where they would do the borrowing, and then they would allocate that funding to a state-owned entity, for instance, who would then work with a contractor from the Far East or from Europe or wherever to, to do that. I think that model is also under stress due to the fiscal challenges through COVID. And hence now in South Africa, but in other markets as well, they're having to open up to more private to private transactions. And I'm really hoping that that is a model that, that takes off a lot more because as much as it may be efficient for governments to borrow, it creates a lot of poorly allocated funding as well. Whereas when somebody has to repay and it's a private entity that has to repay, you know, they really need to be very thoughtful about how they spend the money. Okay. So it seems like two themes. One, policy clarity and, and where necessary, not deregulation, but opening up markets through clear regulation. Yeah. And then two, facilitating private to private investment where you drive the efficiency because the person paying the bill is the person whose balance sheet it comes from. And there's clear visibility around that. But that, as you say, opens up opportunities and markets and then that becomes investable. And, and there's a lot of other sectors. You know, we're doing a lot in private student accommodation, um, private affordable housing, in private healthcare, private hospitals. Um, and we're starting to hear about opening up in ports and railways in, in South Africa as well, which hopefully will create, you know, multi-billion rand, you know, investment opportunities, hundreds of millions of dollars of private capital that can come through as well. Um, so, so those are all areas where we're trying to focus beyond just, you know, the energy sector. And, and pure big scale infrastructure, other forms of, of infrastructure, housing, et cetera. So look, I think, We've probably understood a little bit around challenges and, and, and how countries can respond to those particular challenges. I wanted to focus a little bit just to moving on in terms of models for investment and, and successful um, or what might be successful models for investment. And if I were to turn to me, I can come to you. Three decades on in terms of private equity and, and, and um, experience on the continent, what is the appetite from global institutional investors to invest in African private equity? Um, who is African private equity competing with in raising capital? And then, again, just from your personal perspective, is the private equity model the right model? Is it the only model? Are there other models? How do you see that private capital raising um, territory and, and, and who plays in it? Love to hear your thoughts. Okay. So um, I think one has to take that in sort of, I think, many different cuts. So I think the first is, I think, if you're investing in Africa, you're focused on large-scale infrastructure, you're in the development phase. You're not in the phase of 
like in Europe where you people are acquiring already built, already established assets and just playing for yield. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's a very different type of... So if you're referring to that, yeah, there's a question mark about whether private equity is the right kind of capital for that piece of, which I think is what Africa just needs in bucket loads. And the part of the challenge actually is that how does one feel that challenge? Mm-hmm. Yeah, On the sort of what people call traditional private equity, which is what... Um, people invested in the US and Europe, in the UK and everywhere else, which is, I think, is generally growth investment stroke buyouts. I think there's space for that in Africa. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There are funds who do that, who do that well. Uh, but it's a tough country. There are many headwinds with currency, with regulatory changes and the likes in that space. But it is doable and one can get attractive returns doing that. Yeah. But, the, but the, what Africa needs actually is capital for development, for building new roads, new bridges, new um, um, power stations, new distribution lines, new kinds of car manufacturing plants. And that capital, I think, is not private equity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Because the tenure, the risk and the tenure required for those things are longer than what private equity would do. And so what we do sometimes is occasionally when we see something of that nature that has got slightly lower risk, a slightly shorter period to revenue. Mm-hmm. Yeah. We'll go and play with it into that space. But that's only tinkering at the edges. Mm-hmm. So to answer your question directly, I think the challenge of actually Africa is, even in the West, there's development of, development is not done by PE. Mm-hmm. It's a different kind of capital. It takes that high risk slice of everything, which is what Africa needs. And I think it's a challenge because it's usually large corporates and governments and the like, who actually play in that space. That's why you see a lot of China is coming to Africa, builds roads, builds bridges, builds stadiums with their capital and their workforce. But I think expecting PE to play in that space, I think it's really quite tough. It's really quite tough. I mean, yeah. I'd actually kind of disagree a little bit on okay. it because I actually think there is an opportunity for PE. What we've struggled sometimes when we worked with what I would call almost like a traditional American private equity model is that the tenors that they look for and to get out of for infrastructure don't work. There are other, some European private equity funds where they've sourced and worked, I think, specific, with specific LPs that are willing to give them longer and have a slightly more nuanced view of the returns, the equity IRRs even, that they, that they should earn for the level of risk they're taking. The other thing, though, I think it's an opportunity for private equity is you could actually do that investment and at some point post-commercial operation, create another fund that you can sell the asset onto, that you can still manage, but for a, a set of LPs that are willing to take a different risk profile and then a lower return on that, which is almost a debt type return. So, you know, because I, so there is, I think, a model still, because what I've noticed with working with very good private equity funds is that they bring the skills to be able to be on the ground. And, and it's wonderful for us working with them because they do have those skills and you know, you, um, they're able to, to work through to get the projects done, even when we have challenges with them. So, so well, I think, my, my yeah. point is actually about scale, yeah? So yeah. we've done one, you've worked with us on one. Yeah. But Africa needs 300 billion, $500 billion to do that stuff. Okay. And you're not gonna find P money doing that for you. Yeah, look, I, I, I mean, I think it's absolutely clear Africa needs equity to grow. Companies, pride, the private sector needs equity to grow. And I was in Nigeria last week and, you know, you meet these wonderful young entrepreneurial companies um, that really are providing solutions to many of the challenges in the country or they have the potential to do that, but they need equity. Mm-hmm. Um, the problem is, um, and we have with Baba, we have Angelios, we have the best in class here on the stage, but... We're the largest investor in uh, private equity funds in sub-Saharan, in, in Sub-Saharan Africa. And when I look at our portfolio performance over the last uh, 10 or 15 years, it it's, has not been terribly positive. And I think it starts with the model is we, we have imported a model from the US and from Europe, which says we should charge 2 and 20 on committed capital, which said we should have five-year investment periods, which says we should have 10-year lives. And those just, and we should, which say we should be inve- we should be dollar based. None of those things really work in an African context. The, the, it's too expensive. It takes too long to get the money invested. The egg, the potential for exit is too is, is too limited. Um, and then the dollar for the investors, for the LPs, because obviously the money is going in, in lo- effectively in local currency in most cases. 
And so the dollar, you have this constant depreciation or this consistent depreciation that hurts your, your dollar returns. So I think we need equity, so we can't throw the model away. And we have to support the people that are really delivering against it. But I also think we have to redouble our efforts to try and find other vehicles, Correct. whether it's permanent capital vehicles. You know, we're looking at a project in Ghana, which is basically local currency lending, because that's what most companies uh, need, but risk-based lending. So subordinated lending with, re- you know, revenue shares. So I think companies in, in Africa are willing uh, to, uh, are, are, are often unwilling to give up ownership. And that's one of the issues. So the, some of the best companies, they just don't want outside equity owners, but they are prepared to give up risk capital. They are, they are prepared to share upside. Yeah. So I think there is a, um, but it is very difficult. I'm sure Baba will tell you when you go around as an African GP yeah. to visit the, the traditional funders of private equity in Africa, you're, particularly, I have to say, the DFIs, yeah. they have one model that they recognize and they're very unwilling to experiment. That's why this project in Ghana will do by ourselves. Uh, uh, so, but it's, yeah. yeah, and just to develop, I guess, on that. So, so we need new models. We can't throw the baby out with the bathwater because it's still serving a purpose. And, and Mohan, to come to your point, e- even if it's at a smaller scale, it's having an impact in the, mm-hmm. in the places it's investing and um, it's got its own job to do. But um, Israel, maybe I could bring you in here. Where are those different models going to come from? Hmm. Do we know? Um, who's going to stand behind those? In the Is it the development finance uh, community? And Nick, it's coming back to you, don't you worry. Hmm. <laughs> There's a question. Yeah. But you know, where, where is that investment going to come from in patient capital with different financial instruments, which needs us to reinvent a wheel here because we've got some old wheels from taken from somewhere else, which let's agree, maybe aren't quite doing as as well as they should. But any thoughts as to where that might come from? Well, look, the short answer is that it has to come from everywhere. Um, And this goes back to the point that there are opportunities across all sectors, across across the continent. But today also, I mean, I've anecdotally, I've had a couple of conversations earlier today with people who have just come up with their own own startups and they are fantastic ideas. Mm -hmm. So you need also investors, maybe from the private equity side, although I'm, I'm more on the commercial lending side. Mm-hmm. But those startups, um, they do need support from the private equity space. They need patient capital. They need local currency funding. But from my perspective, representing a commercial bank, again, there is a need for all types of solutions. And I don't think we can resolve all the issues today. But um, look, we, we are an international bank. We lend in hard currency. It's very important for us to partner with with the likes of BII, DBSA, and the private equity on the project finance uh, space. Um, But where there is a more of a pressing need today in these market conditions is having a layer of, um, maybe mitigation is not the right word, we're debating this a little bit earlier with uh, with Mohan, Uh, passing on the risk to someone else is not necessarily the solution. But having the multilaterals, and we have the AFC, AFREXM, AFDB, all those giants in, in the continent in particular, partnering with them and having them involved in some of the uh, transactions that we do as a commercial bank brings a layer of more, maybe accountability on the borrower's side as well, because there is so much liquidity out there that could be deployed, but it has to be deployed um, in such a way that lenders like, like ourselves stay comfortable for the long term. Another thing that I just wanted to touch on, I don't, I no longer recall, maybe it was Samaila who mentioned this earlier this morning, that look, there is aid coming into the continent. Why don't we transform this aid into insurance or into guarantees? Because in this case, you know that the money is going into productive areas. Mm -hmm. So there are different solutions that are, they could be basic, but if implemented, I think they could be more conducive to helping um, economic growth. Uh, And and just maybe one final point on that. the continent is very big, mm-hmm. right? You have 54 countries. I know that earlier in the, in the day, it was referred to as only one continent, which is, which is fantastic when you are looking at the upside or the positive side of things. But unfortunately, uh, today, if something happens on the Western side of the continent, the investors somehow think, some investors, not all of them, think that there are issues on the, on the Eastern side. And that's why it's very important to try to understand the local markets, what the needs are what the solutions are, and then also try and use these bright spots, if you like, and apply the same solutions to other parts of the continent. So 
So we'll, we'll come back to your second point, which is you know, each country effectively is, it, is its own country and, there, and there's over 50 of them and, and you cannot treat everything the same and expect to get the same results in each case. But coming to your first point, and, and Nick, I promise I come back, development finance and risk-taking and, and um, insurance or, or guarantees the current role that development finance is playing and, and the likes of BII are playing, um, <clears throat> both by investing, but also being a catalyst for others yeah. to invest mm. and taking that extra bit of risk. Mm. Do you th- think that it's working at the moment mm. is the, the first question. Mm. The second question is development finance is under its own pressure with budget cuts and, and proposed budget cuts. So how does this play out over the next mm. few years? Well, so I think we've done a better job of investing our own capital than we have mobilizing other people's capital, to be honest. And I, uh, you know, our, the, our, our own capital is not insignificant. At the G7 last year in, in um, the UK presidency of the G7, uh, the development finance, the, the, the G7 development finance communities and the multilateral came together to commit $80 billion to private sector in Africa over the next five years. That is not an ins- that is not an, an ins- a significant amount of money, so they are important. But as we discussed before, I mean, they're not uh, the amount of money that's needed is so much bigger than that, and it's so much bigger than the sort of the aid budget that you can put on, on top of that. So I do think um, we need, as a group, to become more uh, creative and innovative about the way that we mobilize other capital. We had a presentation earlier on from CPDQ talking about blended finance. And blended finance is, is, can be a complex instrument, but particularly in areas like infrastructure, particularly where you have reasonably predictable cash flows coming off projects, often there is this gap that, that, uh, that can be filled by, by blended finance. So I think we need to sort of redouble our efforts to try to find, uh, uh, ideally try to standardize a little bit more the blended, fi- uh, the blended uh, finance market. I think it would be useful for us to think more actively about recycling some of our investments. So I think often, um, uh, I mean, the role of the DFI should be coming in relatively early, coming in during the development cycle, uh, uh, sort of the riskiest part of the project, if you like. I think we should think more, we, f- we should be more, a- there's a tendency once you've got the project and generating cash that you want to hold on to it. But actually our responsibility is probably to, to, to uh, uh, make more uh, uh, operating projects available to the, to the, to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, um, to the uh, private sector. Mm-hmm. I think we probably want to be more active. And one of the things we've tried to do at BIO over the last couple of years is be more active in working with larger companies. Like we've worked with Vodafone, we've worked with DP World, we've worked with Scottech, we're mm-hmm. doing multi-hundred million dollar investment, equity investments alongside them to try to help catalyze their development and their, the, accelerate their growth in Africa. And so I think, again, that's from us, from a, from a risk perspective, it's, it's a, it's a fairly risky uh, uh, thing for us to do, but I think does really can can really make a, a difference. So there are it's, it is a question of becoming just a bit more creative and innovative and taking a little bit more risk. I think. And you didn't say it, but it, partnerships it seems, and sort of venturing with others mm-hmm. as maybe a way of spreading some of that risk. I mean, we've we've touched a little bit more, and you mentioned the point about having PE behind various investments and how that's seen as a, as a positive thing because it's spreading risk, it's working with partners um, to build a bit more scale um, than maybe just trying to do things by yourself. But, Mohan, well, I wanted to bring you into this discussion as well because, you know, thinking about creative solutions is, is your day job. Um, what are the other types of things that you think is, is, um, is needed or, or which the, the DBSA is looking to get behind? Well, you know, as an African entity, I mean, I think a lot of the, the drive has to start from home, right? So we are trying to work with our own pension funds, as an example, to try to crowd them into the investments. Because I think if African entities are investing in our projects, in our investment capability, then I think it makes it a lot more palatable for international investors to then come and invest alongside us in the process. It also helps with issues around having you know, having local entities at risk with these projects is actually quite good as a risk mitigation instrument. Mm -hmm. So one of the things we do is we work closely with a number of the Southern African development finance institutions 
to have them invest with us in the investments we make in their home countries. So as an example, we just did a transaction about two and a half billion rands uh, or Namibian dollars in Namibia, which works out to, let's say, about 125, 150 million US, where we um, did about 80% of the investment, 20% came from the Development Bank of Namibia. Mm-hmm. Um, and we're trying to do the same in Botswana, which is a country that also has very large pension assets to try to find ways of bringing in Botswana pension funds into what is a pooler market so that, you know, you're investing in the local currency as well. Um, so, I, and it's nascent in a lot of countries outside of, I'd say, South Africa, Botswana, Mauritius, uh, Namibia. But if we don't do that, if we don't create the local pension funds, um, it's going to be very difficult to be able to solve for a lot of these problems as well. And once, I think for the global investors here, once you see local African entities investing in their own projects, you know, it creates significant opportunities for them to also come in, either even during the development phase or, as Nick was correctly saying, post-commercial operation for us to then offload a significant chunk. Maybe we'll still hold a little bit of it for the life of the project, but 70 80% can be offloaded, and it's a way to introduce uh, international investors into those asset classes and into countries that they may be a little bit risk-averse at development stage, but can come in, get... Uh, uh, of OFE, and then over time can then even come in, you know, during the development phase as well. Yeah, and I like the idea in terms of um, resolving some of the issues through local solutions mm-hmm. and filling some of those gaps in, in local financial markets. Robert, you know, I wanted to just talk about that in the PE industry, yeah. the sense of you know, raising domestic PE yeah. funds yeah. and getting pension funds invested into yeah. to domestic PE. Does that take away issues of currency when you're you know, raising domestic funds and deploying it um, domestically and then building a business and potentially selling it to an international PE fund? Yeah. Is that something else it's which great, makes sense? It's a great question. I mean, I've just been through that cycle, actually, so I can speak from, <laughs> from real-life experience. I think probably you've got actually that in most of these markets, so a place like Nigeria, actually, South Africa is different. It's developed, it's sophisticated. Southern Europe in many ways... <laughs> Like oh yeah, um, <laughs> you go to like a place, <laughs> but you go to a place like I think Nigeria or Kenya. So in Nigeria, it's got like a forty billion dollar pension industry right now. You've got a defined contribution pension scheme where every employee, every company with more than six employees, I was even ten employees, um, every employee puts six percent of their wages, and the, and the employer matches with six percent, and it goes to a pot of money for retirement savings. It's great, it's growing well, it's growing fast. It's um, about 40 billion now. But the problem I think is you've got treasuries at 12, 13, 14, 15% risk-free treasuries at those rates. What are you gonna do if you're employed by these guys? Mm-hmm. <laughs> Just sit down, put all the money in treasuries and wait for, um, wait for, minimize your risk and get your returns basically from that, yeah? Mm-hmm. And we went through the industry, um, as a, and we knew these people individually, personally, presented to them. Our returns on our Naira deals that we've made down in Nigeria were fantastic in local currency. Um, but still, what we ended up with was an amount that was not, wasn't worth the effort. It was a very small amount compared to just, okay, give you a shot, but it's three million here, two million here. And when you add it all up, it doesn't come to very, very much. Mm-hmm. So um, I think the, so basically I think the, the structure of the markets, when people invest in private equity because they get, um, they see the, 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 you're getting 0%, 1% on treasuries in the U.S. right now, U.S., Europe, and everything else. Um, when treasuries were 8%, the amount of money in private equity was a lot lower. Let's see what happens as the treasuries rise, and you're going to see the money, people are just going to put their money where they think the returns are. Mm. So I think the, the high returns from investing money. It's also the bank, and the banks don't lend to people for projects because the banks just take their balance sheet, deposit, put them in treasuries, sit down, take no risk, and you lend someone money to someone to do a project, they lose the money, you have to chase them around, you gotta make phone calls, mm-hmm. put it in treasuries, nothing to worry about. And also you put money in treasuries, you don't have to also have a capital charge for risk. It's just the whole structure of the market makes it actually very hard with the high treasury rates um, to actually get local capital mobilized to do anything really interesting. But I, I think on that, it, it's also partly a policy issue, right? Because actually, you know, we've done couple of, a lot of energy transactions in Ghana. 
I would rather back the, the, the transaction now that we've done with Jenser, where the offtake are the gold mines, mm -hmm. than the ones where the offtake is effectively the Ministry of Finance of Ghana, mm -hmm. um, especially given the current situation. So yes, you know, we see, and it's starting to happen even in South Africa, where the 10-year government yield is, is over 10%. But as I said, the equity IRR is going below 12%. Mm -hmm. You know, the debt IRRs are below that. So I think investors themselves are starting to see actually a privately backed transaction could have lower risk than lending to a state-owned entity or even the Ministry of Finance. And I think when they become more sophisticated around it, um, you may be able to get better, you know, better allocation of capital going, going into these things. But I do agree that there are some issues where the, the regulation itself is such that it promotes the pension funds just to invest in government bonds or state-owned entity bonds, which, which is something that needs even to be corporate, but Even corporate bonds, for like, even corporate bonds. But the point is the treasury is the bonds are low risk. We don't have to hire anybody. So you can have a small team, low risk. We've got some CEOs of banks here looking at me with, <laughs> with the corners of their eyes. <laughs> but, um, but I think it's a big impediment. The Nigerian government, by the way, the central bank tried to set up something called InfraCop, where they tried basically tried to strong um, a bunch of pension funds to put money into an entity um, with central bank matching it with billions of dollars, actually, matching it to try to develop infrastructure. Um, they're still working through the details a year and a half, two years later. Um, let's see where it goes. But I think without a push of that nature, I think it's going to be very tough. I think you need a big macro push because they realize that the money is not going to come from elsewhere. So you've got to start from local capital markets, local capital to try to push things. Okay. I think let's pause there. Um, and perhaps we can see if there's any Q&A from the audience. Um, these are some of the um, most influential people in the African continent. So uh, if you have a question, now is your, your time to ask. And I see there's one gentleman in the back. We can probably start with, let's see if we've got, we've got two questions. So this gent there, if we could just get a, a mic and three questions. Let's take three questions to start. This mic on. Thank you, Raiden. <laughs> Thank you. Let me just, uh, as I'm in the middle of the floor, let me just pass it so that I can pass it to Nikki. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Karen. So it's, uh, I'm Mikir Shah. I'm CEO of uh, Africa Specialty Risk, actually uh, an insurance and reinsurance business backed by Baba and Helios. So thank you. Um, we specialize in de-risking investment into Africa. So what Samila, what Nizrin said earlier on today is exactly the key thing. The more investment we can de-risk, the more money will go into Africa and the quicker the continent will grow. Um, we're working with a number of partners already on this, but we're always willing to work with more. So please come and see me later on if you'd like to help this. And then the gent in the front. The two in the front and then one there. Okay. Wayne Hennessy, God, sorry about that. Uh, Wayne Hennessy Barrett, Forgy Capital. The theme of sharing risk, where large banks, DFI such as BII, fantastic private equity houses, can help mobilise capital to where it's needed on the fringes of innovation and risk taking for fintechs like myself. Do you see a rising role for organisations? such as your own, and I guess I'm looking at Nick here, rather than capital allocation directly, but helping with things like guarantee facilities to backstop and help share the risk with local banks so that we can get this capital to where it's most needed, namely to us. Okay, and then one yeah. last question that we'll answer all three, just this gent in the front here. We'll come, we'll do another three afterwards. It seems like we've got a few. Can I get a mic to this gent in the front here? Just right here. He's gone to him there. <laughs> Hi, Douglas Rodings from Edie's Investor Service. Um, it would be good to understand, I mean, really interesting comments that we've heard here, like the, the model that you propose in terms of trying to bring in domestically-based banks with, as I say, African-based banks. But it would be good to understand from your perspective the role that credit ratings can play, and especially, I mean, we've actually had other speakers mention uh, from a foreign perspective, they use it as a screening mechanism. Um, so we get to just uh, hear your thoughts on that. So I think the three questions are, one, just local management and the importance of local management. 
um, and local teams. The uh, second question is around um, sharing risk. I think Nick was for you in terms of um, guarantee schemes, etc. And then the, the question, Mahan, maybe you can take this one around um, credit rating agencies and Israel, maybe you could join in there and the role they'll play. But Obertuna, maybe just yeah. in terms of the need for local management right. and Correct. 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 I, mean, I mean, I can't agree with that statement more actually than we discussed this earlier. Um, I think you know, the so African P, as Nick knows, we've seen us at work, and you've seen as well too. We actually build with business builders. It's about building businesses, which means it's about finding migrant team and helping develop. By it's not it, African P is on, is quite unlike Western P, where you get an investment bank with a perfectly formed business, the great migrant team, and you put money behind. In Africa, it's always a rough diamond. Um, and sometimes you steal the carbon before the diamond, and you've got to do the work to take the rough diamond and build something actually really valuable out of it. Um, I mean, there have been many firsts we've had to do, for example, we've started the first telecom tower business in Africa. We've done the first, um, um, I should talk about it, but the first um, um, LNG degasification terminal in sub Saharan Africa. We've done that as well. Um, we've done, created the first, um, um, what do you call it, green bond for housing products in Kenya. So lots of firsts, but all of that involves actually work to help develop, develop buying capabilities and skills. That's the Africa investment. It's not just money. It's actually, which is what you were saying about finding P. That's the work we do, basically. Okay. So I can't argue with that more. It's a very good point. Okay. Nick, in terms of thinking creatively and, and helping, um, do you want to take that yeah. question? Yeah, well, the question of share, risk sharing with banks. Uh, by the way, on the capacity question, I completely agree. I mean, this is a huge issue. Obviously, DFIs have technical assistance programs and so on, but they're in the overall context of the, of the, of the size of the challenge, they're, 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 um, they're still, I think, inadequate, but it is a huge constraint on, on growth in, in Africa. But, um, on the question of sharing risk, I mean, that is something that, that we do. And I think most of our peer DFIs do a great deal. We have to work through banks because we have to intermediate, uh, our, our capital. We can't afford to be making individual loan or certainly small individual loans ourselves. Um, I think um, we're increasingly, when we work through banks, we're directing our money. So we're not just providing capital to the bank, but we're directing or, gu or guarantee to the bank, but we're directing it to specific areas. We just did a, a, a facility with uh, First Bank in Nigeria, for example, 30% of which was directed to women-owned businesses and 70% to SMEs. So increasingly, that's the way that uh, development finance institutions are, are providing capital. I'd also say that, and you mentioned you run a fintech. I mean, uh, the, there is a, um, to the extent that you need equity, I don't think banks are the right vehicle for that, frankly. Mm -hmm. I, I also think for many small and medium sized enterprises in Africa, that banks, and this, by the way, is not a specific comment about Africa. I think this is true, equally true in the UK that banks really don't, or in the US, I mean, banks don't do a good job of servicing SMEs. It's too, it's too expensive. Um, and so they, they demand, uh, insist on collateral. So if you haven't got land or if you won't give a personal guarantee, you can't get a loan. I don't think, I think we've been beating up on the banks for decades to try to, I mean, in the UK, we've tried to impose, you know, requirements that nothing's worked. I think you, uh, the, the whole world of fintech actually is providing a potential solution to that. Again, I saw that when I was in Lagos last week with a couple of companies that we've invested in, uh, fintech companies, and they are providing unsecured loans to sort of credit to mom and pop stores so they can buy inventory. These type of, 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 of uh, non-bank financial institutions and fintechs, I think, are really worthy of significant support from development finance community. And that's what we are trying to do. And then, Yusrin Mohan, maybe the final question, the role of credit agencies, either want to take that one on? If I may, just to add to what Nick has said and touched on the previous question as well, on, in terms of the, um, the partnerships and how funding can come through for, to SMEs, it's true that this is one of the most underserved um, sectors in, in, uh, in the African continent. But um, from our, we have recently done a transaction which helped finance this sector, but again through a bank, because banks are easier to work with from, from our perspective. So we partnered with a DFI, with the Japanese um, uh, DFI, and uh, we worked with a local bank, and the facility was dedicated to uh, businesses that are run by women, yeah. for instance. So um, uh, there are 
solutions that, that could be used that banks are the best partners for, especially international institutions like, like ours. Uh, when it comes to the credit rating agencies, um, I'm frankly not sure what to say here. Um, I think for us as, as lenders, we do rely on the reports that, that you provide. Uh, they, um, we view them as an independent third party in assessing the risk, so we thank you for that. Uh, sometimes we agree, sometimes we don't, we don't necessarily agree, but, um, uh, but, but yeah, I, I, I don't think I can answer the question, sorry, other than this well, one. Mahan, any final thoughts? Well, I mean, I think in the case of the credit rating agencies, you know, I think it's useful information. We do our own um, credit rating on every country, for instance, that we invest in, but we do compare it. But I think for, you know, for international investors, what is worth thinking about is where they've made a cap that they're only going to invest in investment grade countries or projects. It's a big issue because there's almost no African country that's investment grade. And, but by doing that, you're effectively giving up on massive amounts of investment opportunities. So I think it's fine for the credit rating agencies to, to have their ratings. I think it's valid. But it's also worthwhile thinking, what is the real difference between something that's just a little bit, you know, investment grade versus just below? You know, chances are from a default rate and such, it's not that significant. Um, so, you know, you are going to open yourself up to a significantly more, bigger um, set of opportunities for investment by, by being a bit more thoughtful about that. Well, look, I'm getting signals in terms of time is up. Um, so I think we'll probably call it a day here. I'm sure um, the panelists will be around if people do have uh, questions to ask. Um, but a final thought for me, just to say thank you very much for making your time available for all of us today. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Chris.